Okay, then I will just get uh, going. So I am Shreyan Shetter, and uh, I would really like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my journey from starlight to stellar abundances of S-type stars. So just to give you a brief introduction of what are S-type stars. So S-type uh, is a spectral uh, class on the AGB, so the asymptotic giant branch. And uh, these S stars, uh, the special characteristic features of these stars are the zirconium oxide bands, titanium oxide bands. So basically, they have a oxygen rich chemistry because they have a carbon over oxygen ratio between 0.5 and 1. So they are considered also these transition objects from the M type on the AGB and for the carbon stars. And all the uh, S stars, uh, all the spectra of S stars, they reveal S process abundances. So S process, the slow neutron capture nucleosynthesis, which happens in the interior of the AGB stars. So if we really want to understand this S process or the AGB nucleosynthesis, we can use these S stars as a probe. But you have to be careful here because all S stars show the S process elements, but not all S type stars make the S process elements themselves. Basically, the S stars come in two flavors, the intrinsic and the extrinsic type, where the intrinsic stars, as the name suggests itself, they are intrinsically producing the S process elements, which is brought uh, to the surface of the star with this third dredge up, with the dredge up episodes. And uh, so it's a basically a thermally pulsing, it's a genuine thermally pulsing AGB star while an extrinsic star is a polluted binary. So if you consider a binary evolution scenario, then the extrinsic star is a star which is not yet itself evolved to make the S process elements. So it owes its S process elements to a former binary interaction with a, with a former AGB companion, which has now evolved into a white dwarf. And how do we uh, distinguish these intrinsic stars from the extrinsic stars is then by the use of technetium because technetium is uh, as an S-process element with, not, uh, with no longer stable isotope. So the presence of technetium tells you that the star is a genuine AGB star undergoing the AGB nucleosynthesis and so on. But uh, the absence of technetium uh, features is a sign that the star is enhanced with S-process elements with, because of this binary interaction and it's not an AGB star itself. So hence, uh, uh, these uh, S stars are very interesting, as I mentioned, to understand the AGB nucleosynthesis, to understand the S process. But actually, in particular, the intrinsic S stars, they can really help us understand the third dredge of physics, because they are the first ones on the AGB stage to show signatures of technetium or zirconium oxide and so on, which are really signatures of the third dredge of so if you want to understand the third dredge of physics or the uh, occurrence of the third dredge of how it occurs for the first time, what is its dependence with mass and metallicity and so on, then we can really use these S stars to, to do that. But uh, uh, so yeah, to understand these uh, S stars, to uh, understand the onset physics of the third dredge of as I mentioned, and also to of course derive their abundances, to locate them in an HR diagram, uh, to understand their evolutionary status. So we want to, uh, of course, understand them and do this exercise. But how do we do this? We cannot do this without having the atmospheric parameters of these stars. And uh, the problem for such evolved stars is that apart from effective temperature and surface gravity, which are the usual fundamental parameters, also the parameters like metallicity, carbon over oxygen ratio, the S process index, they also play an important role. So the parameter space is much extended. Apart from that, the parameters are also strongly entangled with one another. So what I mean by entanglement, here I'm comparing two models, model A and model H with completely different sets of parameters to atmospheric models. And they are compared with an absorbed spectrum. This is a high resolution uh, spectrum. And uh, you see that in many spectral windows in the optical, it's really, it's really difficult to differentiate which model reproduces the observed spectrum the best. So what I want to say is that just the high resolution spectrum is not sufficient actually to provide you the estimates, the accurate estimates of the parameters of these stars. So what we did is that we developed a methodology which makes use of the high resolution spectrum from the uh, Hermes spectrograph at the Mercator telescope, uh, which is uh, at La Palma, located at La Palma. And then we combine this with the Gaia parallaxis, the astrometric solution from the Gaia, and also with the uh, um, appropriate moderate atmospheres and evolutionary tracks to really disentangle this uh, complex parameter space of these esters. So I will illustrate to you how we did that. 
let's take an example first of the surface gravity. So for surface gravity, we uh, obtained initial estimate of the, of the surface gravity by just of, of all the parameters basically, by just performing a chi-square fitting, uh, an initial chi-square fitting with a huge large grid of these SDAS model and our observed spectrum. We used these estimates, initial estimates, to locate the star in the HR diagram by combining it also with the Gaia parallax. And from the location of the star in the HR diagram and comparing it with the evolutionary tracks, we could derive a mass of the star and hence the surface gravity of the star. If we iterated over this loop until we had a consistent surface gravity uh, of the star, uh, consistent with the location of the star in the HR diagram and also spectroscopic estimate. Now, after constraining the log G and the temperature of the star, we then further went to constrain the carbon over oxygen ratio, the metallicity, by using spec special spectral windows, which are sensitive to these features. So, for example, the carbon over oxygen ratio can be constrained using CN regions, CN uh, and CH lines. Uh, for metallicity, you can use the metallic lines or some lines with the iron peak elements. So we identified these uh, regions and then uh, use them to constrain these parameters. And once a full iteration is over, you can now disentangle this parameter space uh, with these added extra, um, with the help of this added extra information, you can dis disentangle these parameters and really decide uh, that uh, the most appropriate model representing your observed spectrum for your star is this model A and not this model H. Uh, then your, uh, I wanted to give an example of uh, a validation kind of, of this method because using this final set of parameters, then further comparing it with the observed spectrum, as you can see here, I'm giving an example of uh, two lines, a zirconium line and a cerium line. And you, you can see that the fit with the observed spectrum of this synthetic spectra is really quite good as well. So it's good enough for you to derive abundances as well. And uh, we, have uh, we have developed this method and applied it on several samples of S-type stars, so which you can also find in these uh, different papers I have listed here. So now we can get to the abundances because we have accurate set of parameters, which we can help us to also derive accurate abundances. But with abundances, you do not really just want the, just want to measure the abundances, but you also want to use these abundances to probe the nucleosynthesis of the star. So a good example for that would be the use of zirconium and niobium pair. So we derived the zirconium and niobium pair of these stars. Now what you expect to know from the zirconium niobium is that the monoisotopic niobium, which we find in the spectra of these S stars or HB stars or stars basically enriched with asbestos material, this niobium, uh, a monoisotopic niobium can only be produced by the decay of zirconium. So for the stars, which are intrinsic stars, which are stars, genuine stars on the AGB stage, you expect them to uh, have a zirconium over niobium ratio greater than one because they are just constantly dredging up more and more zirconium, not, had, had, not yet have had enough time to make niobium from this zirconium. While uh, for the stars which are extrinsically enriched, so the extrinsic S stars, barium stars, the uh, CH ions, all these uh, families of stars which are in extrinsically enriched with espresso material, they have a zirconium over niobium ratio of one, which is what you exactly see here, that using zir zirconium and niobium abundances, you can distinguish this sample uh, of intrinsic and extrinsic stars, and hence you can also identify genuine AGB stars like this, so which is a complementary uh, test uh, apart from the technetium lines, of course. What we could also find using this zirconium niobium analysis is uh, a new class of S-type stars. So I already explained to you what are intrinsic and what are extrinsic stars. We found something, uh, we, found, we labeled them bitrinsic because they are they show signatures of intrinsic as well as extrinsic nature. So these stars in this uh, red circle that you see I have marked are stars which show technetium features. So they are genuine AGB stars, but they also show a zirconium over niobium ratio of one. So basically what we are looking at here is an afterlife of an extrinsically enriched star. So again, back to the binary evolution scenario, which I showed at first, what, you, what we are seeing here in, as a bitrinsic star is an extrinsic star itself evolved now to produce these AGB, uh, to undergo the AGB nucleosynthesis and to be in this AGB stage. So it is nice to see the whole binary evolution scenario coming, uh, becoming complete and it is nice to discover these stars using these zirconium niobium abundances. 
the next highlight of these abundance analysis, which I would like to share, is the first time measurements of technetium abundances in a large sample of S stars. Now, these technetium, ab um, technetium abundances are, are pretty tricky to be derived. It's because the technetium lines are located in the blue of the optical uh, spectrum, and they are pretty much blended uh, with uh, many other S process elements. So you really need to derive the other S process elements as well accurately to derive these technetium abundances. And we also try to correlate these technetium abundances with the other uh, stellar properties so that we can see if the chemical status of the star matches its, with its evolutionary status, basically. And here in this figure, uh, I have plotted the abundance profile, uh, the measured abundance profile of the star compared with uh, the uh, nucleosynthesis predictions of the corresponding mass and metallicity. And you see that the agreement is pretty nice. Pretty good. You can find all these results uh, uh, and all the details in this paper, which I have marked here, which has been on archive since last week and which was recently accepted in to be in ANA. Now, this is, of course, a very good uh, example of how everything fits well, how the theory fits well, how you start from a spectra, go to your abundances, and then they finally match well with your predictions. But of course, it's not as straightforward always. So let's now uh, talk about a case where things don't work the way we would want to want them to. So what I'm uh, showing here is a plot uh, just with plain predictions of how the C over O ratio, the carbon over oxygen ratio, and the S process elements, zirconium and lanthanum, how they evolve pulse by pulse in an AGB star. Now to this uh, predictions, I'm going to add my observations or my measurements, basically. So the measurement of the lanthanium abundance, zirconium abundance, and this whole shaded zone is the error around it, because of course the observations come with uh, some error bars. And if we now have to mark the pulse numbers, which are compatible with the C over O ratio and with the S process uh, abundances, then you see a complete inconsistency. What we see is that the predicted carbon over oxygen ratio in the models, it is increasing way too rapidly than the S process abundances uh, in the, uh, that we observe. Uh, and here I have shown just one example for this issue, but this has been also, we found the same issue when we also did this study with many S stars and compared it also with many carbon stars, which you can find in this paper. So here I end my talk by saying that we've come a long way actually from the stellar spectra to abundances and then to compare them with these uh, predictions. And hence the observational constraints are as important as much as advances in the models. And I thank you and I thank also my collaborators for helping me get this work done. <laughs> thank you. You make also the sound effects Fantastic. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot uh, to you for your excellent talk Thank very you. nice and interesting uh, subject and uh, i also want to thank all the speaker of this session to be all of them in time congratulations <laughs> very very nice also Thank it's you. also important for for you to stay in time i have uh, the first question from andreas yes i was going to ask um Parallaxes uh, astrometric measurements for for these very variable objects, yes. thermally pulsing AGB stars, can be problematic. Mm -hmm. Did you take any measures in this direction, or did you somehow try to find objects that are less affected by this in yes. a certain distance range? Or I don't know. I mean, there, there yeah. are many ways of dealing with that <laughs> problem. Indeed. No, 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 you're absolutely right that the red sources uh, definitely face a problem in the Gaia, um, within Gaia. And uh, so basically the S stars, which all I presented uh, today, they are the least variable stars, the least variable S stars. So this was the first, uh, uh, how do you say, um, yeah, selection criteria basically to make this a sample. Apart from that, even between during our study, we found uh, when we were initially using Gaia data release two and within the Gaia early data release three came up, even between the two Gaia releases, we found many differences for some stars uh, between these parallaxes. And uh, we have tried to propagate how this also affects the, uh, uh, um, the parameters which have been derived and also then the abundances. So we had to perform this exercise because if you want to use Gaia, so that's what we have done, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm, I have just another curiosity maybe. 
Yeah. Because you compare, and the final part of your talk, you compare with the prediction, theoretical prediction. Yeah. Have you, I suppose, from your team, have you tried to compare this prediction with other results from other theoretician? Or? No. Yeah, this is a very good suggestion, actually, because this is not, we haven't done this yet. So I plan to do that, actually, where I have already uh, collaboration uh, with, yeah, with things and uh, with Budapest as well. And with uh, so I want to compare it with uh, the new grid model, the Monash models and all different kinds of models to really see how um, they compare with these other models. But we still have to do that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Excellent work again.